We are so glad that you're here today, and the sanctuary is beautiful, and uh, I think sometimes my favorite color is red, white, and blue, so it looks so pretty to look out. Uh, Olivia said to tell y'all she's sorry her laundry was dirty, and I'm not sure what country she's representing today. She said maybe the Caribbean. I don't know. <laughs> but we are very thankful that you are here with us to celebrate our nation's birthday but more importantly, to celebrate our God. We are so thankful to live in a free country, but we can live in freedom no matter what country we're in as long as we live in Jesus Christ. That's where our true freedom comes from. I hope you were in Sunday school this morning. We have a class for everyone. All of our Sunday school classes have gone back to their perspective places now. So if you have not found a Sunday school class, please reach out to Jim Thomas. He'll be glad to direct you to one to try out and give it a try and see if it fits you. And if not, we have multiple classes of different ages, and I know there's somewhere for you. I told somebody this morning, Sunday school is where we get our support. That's where we build our best friendships, and um, so it'll be, it'll be a good thing for you to do is to find a Sunday school class. We'll have a new one starting in the fall. Uh, we'll tell you more about that later. We would like to ask you to be here Wednesday night with us for our uh, prayer series at 7 o'clock worship service. And also our children have their activities and have a meal on Wednesday night. So there's a lot going on. Um, I believe, I don't know, is Mr. Guy here? Mr. Bill? I, are y'all meeting tomorrow, Mr. Bill? You are? Okay. All right. Monday, Monday uh, moment will still be tomorrow. Our uh, Bible study group is at, at 1 o'clock. Uh, in the fellowship hall. So I did want to make sure we had talked about that one way or the other. So that's a good thing. And uh, we, we just hope that you have a good week in the Lord um, and enjoy time celebrating with your families. Uh, we are going to uh, honor our nation this morning at the beginning of our service. I'm going to open in prayer. And following that, we'll present our colors and do our pledge and sing the Star Spangled Banner together. Father, thank you that we can walk in freedom, that we can serve in freedom, we can love in freedom, Lord. Thank you for this great nation, though we are not perfect, Lord. We were built on the foundation of your truth. God, I pray that you would bring us back to that truth, that you would put leaders in position, Lord, who love and respect you, that you would put people of influence to our leaders in position who love and respect you, Lord. And that you would help us, and not just First Baptist Gaston, but uh, the church, Lord, the church of the living God, to stand on your truth always. There is no compromise, Lord, to your truth. Help us to be true and faithful to what we hold in our hearts to be the truth of God. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Please stand for the presentation of our colors. Join me as we say our pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for the singing of the Star Spangled Banner. Stop. 
Thank you, and you may be seated. All righty, well, good morning. Want to go ahead and tell you happy 4th this morning. Happy July 4th. You know, it's really only seven years you get to celebrate July 4th on a Sunday. Uh, but we get to celebrate it today. So we are so, so glad that you chose to worship with us. If you are visiting with us today, do me a favor and find this bright orange card in the Welcome Center and go ahead and fill that out. This is our visitor card. We want to get a record of your attendance today. Uh, so please go and fill that out. If you would, please keep praying uh, for Miss Janice Willits, um, who's still in the hospital. Hopefully, Lord willing, as long as she got a good report this morning, she'll be going to rehab tomorrow. Uh, so that will be good, but please keep praying for her. If you would, let's go ahead and pray. Father God, we just want to thank you and praise you, Lord, for this wonderful day that you've given us to worship you. And God, this is the day in our nation that we honor and we reflect and we remember what everybody in our past did to make this day possible in our nation, for us to truly be free. And God, we thank you for this country. Lord, we pray for our leaders. God, we ask that you would guide and protect our leaders, Father. But most importantly, Lord, we came to the house of God today not to hear patriotic music, not to see the flag. No, God, we came to worship you. And Lord, I pray that we would do that today. And while we do worship you, Father, may we continue to do so as we honor and respect our nation. God, you tell us in Romans that we are to respect authority. And God, that includes our leaders in our nation, Father. But may we do so with love. And may we do this today in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, before we continue on in the service this morning, I would like to recognize the different branches of our military. So, if you either are active or you have served in one of these branches that I'm going to call out this morning, I would just ask that you would stand and allow us to honor you. If you served in the United States Army, would you please stand? And this includes the National Guard. Thank you. All right, you may be seated. If you served in the United States Navy, do we have any sailors today? Mary and Mark, there we go, the United States Navy. Praise the Lord. The United States Air Force. There we go. All right. The United States Marines. Robert, that's right, one. All right, now if we get this last one, we'll be five for five. United States Coast Guard. That's okay, we'll give it, that's all right, that's all right. We are extremely blessed in this church to have so many veterans and so many people that are also active in serving in our nation's military and let me tell you something, church. There's a lot of churches, a lot of pastors that don't like to do patriotic services. But I think they're very important. Of course, we recognize the cross. The cross is always the most important thing. But the reason that we're able to worship the cross freely in this place today is because of what people since 1776, really before that, did for us to be here in our nation. So that's why I, as your pastor and as this church, we will honor July 4th. We will honor Memorial Day, and we will honor Veterans Day. Amen. So if you would, please stand as we continue to sing.
Ma'am, all righty. Well, I'm so excited to preach. I'm always excited to preach, but especially on July 4th. It is one of my favorite times. And actually, yes, I have preached on July 4th before. <laughs> this is not my first July 4th sermon. But if you do have your Bibles, please go ahead and turn to Galatians chapter 5. We'll be in Galatians 5 this morning. And the Lord has laid a message on my heart entitled, The Fascination of Freedom. The Fascination of of freedom. If I had to put this sermon into one sentence this morning, the sentence would simply be this. If we are truly fascinated with the freedom that we have in Christ, then we will stand firm, disentangle ourselves from the bondage of sin, and make the conscious decision to stop taking advantage of God's gracious freedom. Freedom is something that has been desired by human beings since the ancient world. Ever since the ancient world, freedom is something that everybody desires. And freedom is one of those things that because of sin, many people have lived in bondage. Okay? It's not just in the history of America that we see slavery. We see slavery in the Bible. The Bible talks about slavery. God's people, the Israelites, were in slavery. They're so... Slavery has constantly been a thing, so freedom has been something that has been desired and wanting to be obtained. The definition of freedom is this. The power or right to act, speak, or think as one wants without hindrance or restraint. And this is the kind of freedom that our founding fathers envisioned. During the Revolutionary War, Patrick Henry famously said these words, Give me liberty or give me death. Give me liberty or give me death. He wanted freedom and liberation so much that if he didn't have it, he would rather die. If he couldn't be free, he wanted to die. And Patrick Henry literally meant that. And he embodied that. He was a very passionate founding father. He was very outspoken. And we need to remember that when John Hancock put his name on the Declaration of Independence, if the United States, the colonists, the colonies, if we were to have lost the Revolutionary War, all of the names on the Declaration of Independence, all of those men would have been killed. 
because according to the British government at the time, it was treason. So you couldn't do that. So these guys wanted freedom so much that they put their names and could possibly have died. And when they put their names on the Declaration of Independence in 1776, we didn't have a shot in the war. Okay? We didn't have any hope of winning that war. Because if you think about it, America was a ragtag bunch of young men and boys, really. And you're living in a nation that's owned by Britain. And if you do the research, in the colonies, half of the people were Tories, okay? They, they sided with the British, and little less than half were Americans. You couldn't be neutral. And I say Americans, they were colonists fighting for this nation. So it was a huge risk, and this very nation that we are celebrating today was founded upon the fascination and the idea of this freedom. And they lived it, and they embodied it. So, many men and women in the Revolutionary War gave up so much so that we could have our freedom from Britain to become a nation. And the first presidents, the Founding Fathers presidents, you've got Washington, you've got Adams, you've got Jefferson, you've got Madison, you've got Monroe. So you've got the first five. After Monroe gets out of the presidency, they didn't really know what was going to happen to the nation. Because you think about eight, the War of 1812 happening during James Madison's term. And that was when Britain was, that's basically Britain's last stance to say, hey, we want you back. Hey, come back. And even then, there were some people in the nation that wanted to be owned by Britain again. Because they didn't think they could do it on their own with this idea of freedom. But notice how all these years later, we're still, we're, we are still the United States of America. We're still free. And we still fight for freedom, not just in our nation, but across the world. Just imagine if in 1812, during Madison's presidency, if they would have allowed Britain to overtake us. And we would have gone back to being a colony. Well, when I think of the Revolutionary War, and I think of how this nation was founded in 1776, I immediately think of our Christian faith. As a Christian... Christ has set you free. But there's so many people today that are going back to the bondage that once held you. It wouldn't make sense for us as a nation to go back to Britain, right? I mean, if our president, if Joe Biden were to call the prime minister in London and England and say, hey, I want us to be a colony again, that wouldn't make sense. He wouldn't do that. Everybody would be outraged. The President of the United States wouldn't make that call because we are our own nation. And the Bible says that you're a new creation in Christ. So why do you go back to the old ways? So we want to celebrate America, which I think is great. We want to fascinate about freedom. And I love history, and I love looking into that. But before you can fascinate about the history of America, reflect on the cross. And ask yourself this morning, am I really free in Christ? Or am I just going through the motions? We like the benefits of freedom, but we don't want to do what it takes to get it. If tomorrow all the things were gone, I'd work for all my life. And I had to start again With just my children and my wife I thank my Lord above To be living here today Cause the flag still stands for freedom And they can't take that away And I'm proud to be an American Where well, at least I know I'm free I won't forget the men who died and gave that right to me. And I'll gladly stand up next to you and defend her still today. Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land. God bless the USA. From the lakes of Minnesota to the hills of Tennessee, across the plains of Texas, 
from sea to shining sea, from Detroit down to Houston and New York to L.A., where there's pride in every American heart, and it's time we stand and say, hey, sing it out. And I'm proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free. And I won't forget the men who died and gave that right to me. And I'll gladly stand up next to you and defend her still today. Cause there ain't no doubt I love this love. God bless the USA. And I'm proud to be an American where at least I know I'm free. And I won't forget the men who died who gave that right to me. And I'll gladly stand up next to you and defend still today cause there ain't no doubt I love this land God bless the USA yes, the USA All right, you're dismissed. <laughs> so we want to reflect on this freedom. We want to talk about how God blesses the USA. And like we just saying, God does bless the USA. But God also blesses those who follow him and live in his freedom. So let's look on the background of Galatians 5. So Paul is the writer of the book of Galatians. And as we see throughout the book, we see that Christ's death is the reason that we don't have to live by the Old Testament law. So in the book of Galatians, Paul is constantly trying to tell them that church in Galatia, he's saying, look guys, Christ has come, Christ has died, Christ was res resurrected. You don't have to be legalistic anymore. You don't have to live by the Old Testament laws. Because they were having a huge problem with that. The New Testament church was constantly getting confused. And they were holding people to laws. And they were saying, well, you can't join our church because you're not a Jew. And yada, yada, yada. And Paul is basically saying, look, Christ died for all. So we need to serve all. So he's talking about this freedom. So believers no longer have to become Jews or follow the outward ceremonies of the Mosaic law. In short, the gospel is for everyone. Accepting Christ as Savior, but not allowing Christ to serve as Lord of your life, is a huge mistake. And it's a mistake that a lot of Christians across the world, especially in America, have made. So if you do have a copy of God's Word, we're going to read verse 1, and then we're going to read verses 13 through 15. If you would, please stand and honor the reading of the Word of God. Verse 1, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Skip down to verses 13 through 15. For you are called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you, God, for the freedom that we have in you. Will you change our hearts and lives this morning for your glory and our good? In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. you can take a seat. So the question that I want to ask you, based on that test, text, the question I want to ask you as we go on today is, are you fascinated? Are you fascinated with living in the freedom that Christ died for? That's the first question. We got two. And if so, how can we live in that freedom today? How can we live in the freedom that Paul's talking about here? He actually gives us a really clear-cut manual as to how we're supposed to live in this freedom. Now, I could really put this message in about six or seven points. But my mom's here today, so it's only three points. 
I don't want her to cut me off mid-sermon, so I'm just going to go as short as I can, which isn't very short. But anyway, the first step to freedom, step to freedom number one, stand firm in the freedom of Christ. Stand firm. And if you like expository preaching, that's what we got today, because our point is straight from the Word. If you look at verse 1, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore. Stand firm in the freedom that Christ gives. This sentence that we find in verse 1, if you look at it in the original language, is actually functions as a transition verse between the last section in chapter 4 and, fo- and what was followed in verse 5. So, I believe that even though verse 1 is summarizing Paul's previous section, it's really a summary verse. But it has so much application. So he puts all that he's talked about into that one verse. You could probably venture to say that was probably Paul's sermon in a sentence right there. He was summarizing it all together. But before we could take this first step to, in freedom to stand firm, we must realize the magnificent, of, or mag, the well, I'm not going to use that word anyway. We must realize the magnitude, there we go. We must realize the magnitude of what we were rescued from. We were rescued from sin. Okay? If you're a believer in Christ, you were rescued from sin. And sin, unrepented sin, a life of sin, living in sin and not choosing Christ, leads to hell. Sin leads to hell. But accepting Christ and asking for forgiveness of your sin leads to heaven. You were rescued from hell. We don't talk about that enough. You were rescued from that. And until we realize that, we cannot stand firm in the freedom of Christ. And that is what has happened in America today. We forget what was done for us before we got to America. And what I mean by that is before you were born. We forget that there's so many men and women that died for this nation before we got here. And then we also forget what Christ has done for us. I was saved when I was six years old. There are times in my life where I forget that moment when I was saved. And I forget what God saved me from. God did not save you for you to continue to live in sin. He saved you a life from that. So if you really want to be free, you've got to stand firm. But before you can stand firm, you've got to realize what you were saved from. And that's one reason why the founding fathers were so effective. is because they lived in a generation where they saw both sides of the coin. They saw what taxation without representation was like. And then they spent a long time. And that's one thing that we don't talk about enough. There was an eight-year period after the Revolutionary War before Washington was sworn in as president that they basically spent eight years trying to figure this thing out. And they might have got some things wrong, but I promise you I would have too. I mean, that's a huge task. But for freedom, Christ has set us free. And because of this Truth in verse 1, we can rest and have joy in the personhood of Jesus. And in Christ, somebody needs to hear this today. In Christ, we have come to our final resting place. Meaning, you no longer have to run anymore. Meaning, you no longer have to seek joy and satisfaction in a person, in a thing, in a job. Look, if you're in Christ... That's your resting place forevermore. Yes, you're still in the earth and you're still going through struggles and all those different things. But we're going to live together forever and ever. You have arrived with Jesus. Now that doesn't mean that sanctification doesn't continue. It does. We've got to continue to put ourselves down and lift Christ up. But you have arrived so you don't have to run anymore. One of the main reasons that Paul says stand firm, therefore, is because of the deliverance that is found. Everybody wants to be free, but nobody wants to take the stand to actually be free. If you really want to stand firm in the freedom that you have in Christ, here we go. If you really want to stand firm in the freedom you have, then you will stop playing with idols. If you want to apply this step to freedom, if you really want to be free in Christ then you will take the initiative in your life to put down idols. Now, in my original sermon outline, I had a whole entire list of idols. But I decided to condense it down to three categories, three M's. Now, we could sit here all day and talk about idols that we struggle with that keep us from freedom. You want to stand firm in Christ, get rid of these idols. The first one's media. 
The second one's materialism. And the third one's money. Those are all three idols. You know what? If you give the devil an inch, he will become your ruler. And oftentimes he wants to work through those three categories of idols. You talk about media. Well, you could talk about social media. You could talk about how we, walk, we spend way too much time walking, talking about the media and looking at the media and what everybody else has to say about our freedoms or what everybody else has to say about our nation that we don't look in God's Word and realize that we are part of the kingdom of God. I love the red, white, and blue, but I want you and me to be in the eternal kingdom, the eternal nation. Because this is all going to fade away. Life is but a vapor. We are dust. Dust we came, dust we will return. But it's our souls that live forever. And I've said it before. You're either going to end up holy with Christ, or you're going to end up hot. That's reality. And people don't like to hear that, but I'll still tell it, tell it to you because it's truth. So the media. What about materialism? Well, what is materialism? How do you define that? Materialism is getting consumed with things. It can be cars, it can be boats, it can be pretty pointy shoes. I mean, it could be anything. I mean, the ties you wear, you can get overconsumed in materialism very easily. But a lot of it always goes back to money. It's like Christ said, you can't serve both God and money. An idol can really be, if you define it, an idol can be anything that goes against God or something that you cherish and treasure more than God. So you want to stand firm. Get rid of those idols. Let me ask you this. And I'm guilty of this too. So I'm asking myself this as well. I don't have it on me. But how much time do you spend on the phone. Calling, texting, social media, whatever. How much time do you spend on the phone. Compared to spending in God's word. Does the time you spend in devotion with God's word equal the amount of time you spend on your phone? Priorities need to change. Priorities need to change. And we live in a society where the past 70 years we have seen so much technological advancement. I mean, things have advanced so much. And what has happened is that things have advanced to where it has overtaken many of us by surprise. To where we no longer spend as much time with God as we used to. Because we have something to distract us. And over time it's become an idol. And over time it's become something that we might subconsciously realize it. And not consciously realize it. But we cherish it more than we do our relationship with God. As I close this point. I want to share this quote with you. And this illustration. If you don't. And I don't know who quoted this. But if you don't stand for something. Then you'll fall for anything. So you've got to decide today, if you want to live in the freedom of Christ, you've got to realize what, you've delivered, what you are delivered from, and you've got to make the decision to stand firm against idols. You've got to stand firm in Christ. So, if we're going to fall for anything if we don't stand for something, then why don't you stand for the person who gave it all? That was Christ. When the British soldiers tried every traditional tactic to defeat the Patriots and try to gain an edge during the war, the Patriots never wavered or, give or, to, get, or never gave up. A lot of people don't realize we were losing the war the entire time, okay? And, you know, brag on South Carolinians for a moment. When Swamp Fox and a few of those other guys started driving General Cornwallis back up to North Carolina, back up to Virginia, the main point of that was that he wanted to keep General Cornwallis in South Carolina for as long as possible to allow Washington and the troops to get ready when they came back up towards Virginia and then they could just clash and hopefully we would win. Well, we also had a lot of help from Marquis de Lafayette and the French. Okay, they really helped us out. If we did have the French, we wouldn't have won the war. So, of course, allies are important. That is important. But if the patriots, especially when you think of Washington crossing the Delaware and that majestic photo, and if you also look at Valley Forge and you see the winter of Valley Forge and you see the dead soldiers who froze to death because of starvation and frostbite, but Washington somehow, some way convinced them to continue to fight. Keep fighting. But it's all about the idea of freedom. Because they weren't going to get paid. 
They wanted to get paid, but they weren't going to get paid. And so they kept fighting. They kept fighting. What if they would have given up? And there's some people today that are counting on your faith in Christ. Don't give up in Christ. Don't give up in that freedom. Yes, it's going to be hard, but stand firm. Stay the course for the freedom that Christ died for you. Because unlike the patriots, we know our outcome. We know where our victory is. The battle's already been won. But yet, sometimes I feel like we waver more than the patriots. And we already know who won. Stand firm. Step to freedom number two. Disentangle yourself from the bondage of sin. So, in verse one, Paul tells them, stand firm. This is your freedom. Christ has set you free. And then he says, do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. And what he's saying there is don't go back to the slavery of sin. Because in the life of Christian, of a Christian, when you accept Christ, you're no longer a slave to sin, but you are a slave to Christ. You are a slave to righteousness. You are a slave to doing the things that Christ tells you to do. But in that, there's freedom. Because you're not eternally separated from God. The definition of entangled is this. Cause to become twisted together with or caught in. Bondage, the definition of that is the state of being a slave. No one in their right mind, nobody wants to go back to being a slave once they are free. Once you got your freedom, you don't want to go back to that. Many of us have heard many stories of and you might be one of these people, but we've all heard stories where somebody is in a bad job, okay? They're doing a job that just doesn't fit their personality. They don't like their boss. Somebody's hard on them. It's just a rough situation. And while you're working in your job, you feel like you're enslaved to your employer. And you feel like you can't get out. And it's just a terrible job. Okay, so let's say this person finally gets the offer for a new job. They go to a new job, they get a new job, they're working on it. A month later, you go back to this place of work and you see that person still working at the same place they used to work at. And you go up to them and you say, I thought you didn't like working here. You complained about the conditions, about how you were treated, and all of these different things. The reason why that happens is because we are way too comfortable in what we know and what we're used to. That we allow ourselves to stay in bondage. And that's how it is with sin. We allow, we're so used to sin. Because whether you realize it or not, nobody had to taught you, teach you how to sin. Nobody sat there and said, Brady, this is how you hit somebody when they do something you don't like. No, that isn't how it happened. It just came out swinging. I mean, that's just how it goes. That's our nature because of sin. When Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, that's where it goes back to. So, when Christ set you free as a Christian, many of us want to run back to sin because that is where we are most comfortable. That's what we like the most. And it's like Paul said, I do the things I don't want to do. It's very similar to that. So, Paul ends this transitional verse by saying, hey, don't go back to the things that Christ died to set you free from. Don't go back to what he fought for. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back. No turning back. And I already sang once, so I won't do it again. But that's a good song too. If we want to disentangle ourselves from the bondage of sin, we got to know who's setting us free. John eight thirty six. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. If the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. I want, to, I want you to listen to the following question that David Platt asked concerning the freedom of Christ in relation to John 8, 36. This is what David Platt said. If you know this, so if you know this freedom, if you know this truth from John 8, 36, if you know this, but aren't, are not glorifying Christ deeply because of it, then it raises the question, why not? One of the answers has to be that you have forgotten how terrible slavery was. It doesn't matter how long you've been saved. One of the problems we run back to the bondage of sin is because we forget about life, what life was like without Christ. We forget about what life was like before we knew the Lord. And how deeply broken we felt and how lost we felt. Well, what, about you? what if you're like me and you accepted Christ when you were a young age? Think about what we were delivered from. In our salvation. 
Christ still did a work in our lives as well. Many people in the pews today need to disentangle yourself from sin by realizing how bad sin really is. Because we have a problem in America where we pump up sin because we don't want to offend people. Think about that. We don't want to offend people, so we allow sin to become the normality and we conform to it. Well, that is why carnality has become such a big problem in the Christian church. And carnality is simply the state of just being lukewarm. And being okay with things just the way they are. The lack of repentance of sin, the lack of repentance, the lack of asking Jesus forgiveness sends people to hell every single day. It's very, very serious that we talk about it. And it's very serious that as we talk about it as believers, we disentangle ourselves from the bondage that Satan is trying to get a hold of us with sin. Because we talked about it before. Satan wants to make sin look as attractive as possible. But you've already been bought. You have been bought with a price. And you are already your saviors if you know the Lord. Disentangling oneself from sin is to realize the severity of sin. And early Americans understood the severity of taxation without representation. They understood that they were being wronged. They understood that you, there were people that were putting taxes on them that were 3,000 miles away. They didn't even know their name. They realized that. So they did something about it. Well, how many of us realize something in our life about our sin, but we push it to the side because we don't want to become uncomfortable? we got to bring that to the forefront of our minds constantly to disentangle. Quit climbing back into the crib of sin. You were bought with a price, but you want to get back in the crib. It's a cage. Christ is the only one that can set you free. Warren Wearsby described it as this. There are some believers who are frightened by the liberty that they have in God's grace, so they seek out a fellowship that is legalistic and uh, dictatorship and where they can let others make decisions for them. Some Christians decide that they have this liberty in God's grace, but they want somebody to always tell them what to do because they're too afraid to live in the freedom of the Lord. It's just a, it's a crazy concept to wrap our brains around. But so many of us today are in a crib. I want to encourage you to get out of it. I want to encourage you to get out of it. Step number three. Step to freedom number three. Stop taking advantage of the freedom God gives. Stop taking advantage of the freedom God gives. Verses 13 through 15. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Paul reminds them. He says, you've been called to freedom. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Do not use your opportunity for the flesh. Don't take advantage of God's grace. And whether we realize it or not, everybody here today has taken advantage of God's grace before. Look, when God saved you from his sin or from your sin, that didn't give you a license to keep doing it. It saved you from it, so you don't have to do it anymore. It's like when you got your driver's license, you no longer had to ride your bike or get on the horse and buggy or whatever. You no longer had to do that anymore because you had your driver's license and you could drive a car. Now, unless you got your license taken or the car taken or something happened, you wouldn't go back to those old ways. Because everybody likes to drive fast, right? Life in a fast lane. So if you want to keep your license, then of course you're going to keep doing uh, your driver's stuff and, you know, renewing it and all those different things. Don't go back to it. Don't take advantage of it. And we've seen in our nation that we have the freedom to do so many different things. We have the freedom. I had the freedom today to preach from God's Word. You know how many countries there are today where this doesn't exist anymore? And I think it's important that we continue to honor and celebrate the fact that every Sunday morning we get to stand up for the reading of God's Word. I hope and I pray there never comes a day where that freedom is taken from us. But it could happen. And at some point it will. And we have to stand firm in that freedom 
And we have to disentangle ourselves from the world. And we've got to stop playing games at the foot of the cross. When you take advantage of God's grace, you're playing games with God. God's mercy, God's grace is all real, but so is His judgment. So is His judgment. It's real. We offer, here we go, we offer, oh, oh, let me back up. So we have the freedom to worship freely, correct? We have the freedom to worship freely. We have the freedom to preach the Bible. We have the freedom to teach it in Sunday school. We have this freedom in our nation, but many of us today are guilty of taking advantage of that freedom. Well, let me break it down. As a church, we offer around approximately 8 to 10 worship services a month. And I'm counting Wednesday nights in that. We offer 8 to 10 this church offers 8 to 10 worship services a month. And we actually offer a lot more than other Southern Baptist churches do. But we offer 8 to 10 services a month. Because our Wednesday nights are not a devotion. That's an actual message, okay? If you haven't been, you need to come. We have worship, we have prayer, and preaching, all right? So that's a feeding time. The sheep need to come. The average church attender, if you want to be considered an average church attender, attender in, a, in a Southern Baptist church, then the statistics say from the convention that you will attend two of these ten a month. That's what the Southern Baptist Convention, because church attendance has become so inconsistent, if you come to church 20% of the time, you're considered a regular attendee. That's a problem. And I've talked to people and they say, well, I'm just coming on Sundays. That's okay. You know what God's Word says? We gather on Sunday, or Sunday because Christ rose from the grave on Sunday. And this is our day to worship the Lord. But on Wednesdays, if we're all honest, we all need a midweek fuel up. We all need something to get us through the end of the week. Because if we don't get it from God, we'll look to the world. Eight to ten worship services a week, and some people count themselves as regular attendees, and they come twice a month. This is carnality in the Christian church, and it has led us to take advantage of God's grace to gather. Our carnality, our sin has allowed us to take advantage of God's grace. This nation is free, but we don't freely worship. Because even when you come in a place and you do worship, if it's one of the two times you come a month, you sit here and you think about what you're going to eat when you leave. Or maybe you sit here and you boil about somebody you're upset with. Or you think about what somebody's wearing while you're here. And you're upset about it. And you're thinking about what somebody said to you before you came. Or you're thinking about that person you needed to call who you think disrespected you. Have you ever realized that sometimes people have a bad day? Not everything is against you. And when it is, don't take it out on your preacher. <laughs> and you laugh, but boy, it happens. Preachers make mistakes too, amen? Boy, I make a bunch of them every day. All the time, really. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Listen to this. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some. Boy, that's good. I don't know who wrote Hebrews, but that's good. But encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. But see, regular church attendance is just an example of the way that we take advantage of freedoms in this nation. That's just one example I decided to harp on. You know, church should be the thing that keeps us from doing other things. It should not become an excuse. Other things should not become an excuse for not going to church. It's important. And not just you, but your whole household, your whole family. God's forgiveness is real. And he will always forgive you of your sin because he's a merciful God. But we must be sure we don't continually take advantage of it. And that's why today in every service, you guys know this, this altar is always open. Yes, we're saved, but we constantly need to have a repentant heart. We constantly need to repent. Maybe you like to repent at home. Sometimes I like to repent when I'm driving. And sometimes when I get repentant when I'm driving, I got to make sure I put my foot on the brake. because I get a little excited. But maybe today, guess what? 
You haven't been leave, living in the freedom that God gives. You've been taking advantage of it. This is a perfect opportunity today to lay your burdens down and pick up the cross of freedom, the flag of freedom in your life. You're not meant to live a life of being uptight. You're supposed to be free. And Christ died for you to be free. But you have to make that decision. Some of y'all thought we were about to have the invitation. <laughs> Not yet. According to verses 13 through 15, the best way to not take advantage of God's grace is to live your life to love Christ, to love others, and to love to serve. Now, if you've been coming the past month and a half, because I got sick and all that stuff. If you've been coming the past month and a half, you're probably like, wow, Pastor, you've been talking a lot about serving and loving and serving and loving and serving and loving. That's the Christian life. When we don't talk about it, that's a problem. So yes, every sermon points to Christ, and because it points to Christ, it points to loving Him and serving Him. Tony Merida said, Christian freedom is not a freedom to sin, but a freedom from sin. We are not free in the sense of running wild and living lives full of sin. Okay, we're not free to go and do that because we are slaves to Christ. We're slave, slaves to His freedom. And as a Christian, we are totally free from sin entirely so that we could do what Christ wants us to do. The call to freedom is the call to a oneness in Christ and a loving service within a community of believers. God did not save the Galatians to be a group of isolated individuals. He saved them to be the church. The church with a called purpose. God did not save Gastonians. I'm not a Gastonian, but that's okay. I'm a Greer boy. But God did not save this church, the people in this church, for us to be isolated individuals. He saved us so that we could be the church. And we could live on mission. That's why we do what we do in VBS and all the different ministries that we are affiliated with and that we serve. But we must adhere to this third step of freedom found in Scripture. Because many Christians spend so much time following the American way of life. And the American ideal, idealization of, the, of Christianity than we do the actual Bible. A problem in this nation is that we have caused Christianity, we have put the American dream in Christianity. When in all reality, we need to put Christianity in the American dream. That's a problem that we have. God loved you so much that he sent his one and only son for you. To liberate you from sin entirely. Why aren't you living for him? If you want to live a, a life... If you want to live that life that Christ himself died for, stand firm in the freedom of Christ, disentangle yourself from the bondage of sin, and stop taking advantage. Listen. Stop taking advantage of God's grace. Maybe this morning you haven't been to church in a while and God is just tugging on your heart. Maybe God's saying, you know what? I can't call you back to freedom because you haven't even answered my first call. You can't be free if you haven't. You can't get free again if you haven't first been free. Maybe today you need to have your emancipation proclamation. Maybe today you need to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's never too late. And if you're worried about what people are going to think about you, I can promise you. I can't promise a whole lot, but I can promise you these, this group of people will rejoice with you. And guess what? That's not always true in church, sadly. But it is in this one. Maybe you need to accept Christ. Maybe, you know what, today you have been in bondage to sin so long. You need to rededicate your life. You know, one thing the American church fails to do is that we don't talk about rededication enough. Maybe you need to come back to the path of Christ. You need to follow Him. Maybe today you've accepted Christ, but you've never been baptized. Guess what? First Sunday in August, we're baptizing. Maybe you need to be baptized. You've never been baptized before. You need to follow in believer's baptism. Why don't you come down here? Let me know. Maybe you've been visiting our church for a while, but you've never joined as a member. Well, you want to have the freedom in Christ? Why not have the freedom of church too? 
a church family that loves you just the way you are. Let's pray. Father, as we have this time of invitation today, Lord, I pray that you'll move and that your will will be done during this time. God, I ask you call people to yourself. You call people to pray. Second Chronicles says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. God, what a beautiful way to end a patriotic service than for folks to come and pray for our nation, to pray for each other. God, I pray that if somebody's here today that doesn't know you, that they'll get saved today. What better day to get saved than on July 4th, the day of freedom? But in all reality, that doesn't matter. All that matters is that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. God, will you call people to do business with you in this time? In Jesus' name, and all God's people said,